This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging's monthly public lecture series. My name is Danielle Glorioso, and I'm the Director of Research and Development at the Stein Institute. At the Stein Institute, we're committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through community outreach, training, and research. This public lecture series is an example of one of our community outreach programs. This public lecture series started over 20 years ago with the idea in mind that we wanted to get exciting research that's happening in aging out to the public. As many of you know, this public lecture series has been sponsored for free for these 20 years, and it's been entirely through the private donations. So we'd like to thank you for all of your support through the years. If you'd like to learn more about the Stein Institute or donate to the Stein Institute, you can find us on the internet at aging.ucsd.edu. So I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Colin Depth, who's not only a colleague, but he's also a friend. Dr. Colin Depp is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the School of Medicine here at UCSD. He's also a researcher at the Sam and Rose Stein's Research on Aging. Dr. Depp has a strong interest in aging and bipolar disorder, particularly in the development of psychosocial interventions. And he's also a clinical psychologist specializing in uh, psychosocial interventions for bipolar disorder, behavioral interventions to enhance treatment engagement and adherence. Please welcome Dr. Colin Depp. Okay, thanks for having me and uh, good evening. Thanks for coming to this. So I'm gonna be talking about successful aging and, the, and some ideas that we've had about uh, incorporating the kind of realm of mental health into that. Uh, and I usually like to start off with a couple of quotes in thinking about successful aging. The first from JFK who says, it's not enough for a great nation merely to have added new years of, to life. Our objective must be to add new life to those years. And the second quote from Oscar Wilde, which kind of points out that it's easier said than done. To get back my youth, I would do anything in the world except take up exercise, get up early, or be respectable. <laughs> so what well, I'll cover a number of things uh, today and, and talk about how we know what we know about successful aging uh, and sort of our contemporary idea about it is, such as it is. Talk about how that kind of relates to mental health uh, and some new ideas that we've had in that regard. Then I'll talk about kind of what you're probably most interested in. What are the biological and behavioral determinants of successful aging and more specifically, what can you do about it? And then, of course, love to hear your, your questions at the, at the end. So I'm going to go back a little way. So when we started the Stein Institute, or at least the, the sort of successful aging of the component of the Stein Institute, we started the idea of her trying to figure out who is the first person to talk about successful aging. And as I'll show you on the next slide, it was definitely not Aristotle. So he said, he has a, a fairly long essay that has to do with aging, and he says, about older people, they've lived many years, they've often been taken in, and they've made mistakes. The result is that they are sure about nothing and underdo everything. They think, but they never know. They are cynical. They tend to put the worst construction on everything. They are small-minded. They are coward. This actually goes on for about five or so pages. And this is from his sort of theory. And this is kind of one theory of aging, which is something called the humoral theory of health. So you had different levels of bile. And so one way of thinking of aging is, is in this way, and I think in an unfortunate way, is that aging is a disease. And so uh, the metaphor at that time, and I think metaphors were not, as, not quite as loose as they are today, but this is actually what they thought, which is that aging was a drying and a cooling of, a of the body, sort of like a lamp 
running out of oil. And so you could add heat and water and preferably stay away from older people, but there really wasn't much you could do to uh, change the aging process. Um, that's one view, and I think that's the view that we're trying not to take uh, contemporarily. So I actually would encourage anybody to uh, uh, take a look at some essays by Cicero, who in uh, a little bit, uh, about 100 years BC, had a, a very nice essay. So he was a Roman statesman who talked a lot about politics and government, but he also had a nice essay about aging. And so in this essay entitled On Old Age, he said, uh, he basically systematically refuted all of the prior points that he could r r read about what aging was and what it wasn't. So he talked about how older people could uh, potentially uh, take on active pursuits instead of, uh, I'm sorry, take on advisory functions instead of active pursuits. Uh, he also said that, I think famously, that an old man never forgets where his, b his treasure is buried. So old people, memory is not necessarily a unitary phenomenon. So memory might be impaired also if you do not exercise it. So his solution was really more to kind of adapt to the aging process. And, and aging is not necessarily a disease per se, and also maybe a, a determined to some extent by what we do during our lifetime uh, uh, beyond uh, sort of um, avoiding uh, heat and water. So you might think that this issue would have been resolved by this essay that uh, aging is maybe not such a bleak uh, diagnosis, so to speak. But actually, when you think about mental health, aging is not necessarily, a, 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 in terms of early psychiatry, it has not always been seen as a, in a positive light. So this is a quote from Sigmund Freud, who said that near or above the age of 50, the elasticity of the mental process, uh, processes upon which treatment depends is, as a rule, lacking. Old people are no longer educable. So he said this at age 49, I like to point out. Um, <laughs> the opposite of that, I think, is what Eric Erickson, I think it's cut off at the bottom, said that life is at the gateway to middle age will stimulate its own intrigue, surprises, and exhilaration of discovery. So I think that's a different viewpoint that people continue to develop. And I think that's kind of where we kind of move into the more contemporary views about successful aging uh, and what's possible in older age. So actually, the kind of the preeminent model or sort of discussion about what is successful aging was by these guys, Rowan and Kahn, in the 1987 article in the, in the famous journal Science. Uh, actually, Roe is uh, now the CEO of Aetna Insurance, and so has certainly been successful from a financial standpoint. Uh, but they wrote an article called Human Aging, <coughs> Usual and Successful. And basically, they argued that most, about 99.9% .9 of the literature focused on this discrepancy right there, that most studies were on the difference between usual aging, howsoever defined, and pathology. So what's the difference between normal aging and uh, diabetes, or Alzheimer's disease, or bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia? And they said that about 1%, or maybe even less, had been devoted to understanding what this difference is between sort of usual aging and success. Uh, and so we should devote some serious effort to figure out that maybe this difference is kind of going to yield us some more information about how we can avoid pathology in, in the future. And so what they did was form a, a foundation uh, to commit research uh, efforts to study a group that they defined as aging successfully for about a decade, and this was in the 90s. Now, the devil is, of course, in the details with respect to how you define successful aging. And so this is uh, how they defined it. And I, many of you may have already seen this. This is actually from a, um, a, 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 a number of publications that have looked at this. But basically, this is kind of how they conceptualized it. In the middle is success. And you have to have one of, uh, I'm sorry, all of these three things. Uh, an absence of disease or disability. Uh, and so that's a pretty high standard for most people to, to bear. Uh, high cognitive and physical functioning relative to your peers, uh, and then engagement with life, which they defined as being active in social relationships, and then also having some productive involvement, such as through volunteering, paid work, uh, or, or child care. Now, so this is a, a one way to think about it, and I think my argument uh, moving forward is that there are many other pathways or other definitions that could be possible. 
Um, because I think we're going to see the problem with this definition on the next slide. So when you think about all these things, how common would you think this would be in the population? How, maybe just guesstimating, what percentage of people who are older than 65 would fit in the middle there? Just throwing out numbers. 10%? Do I hear 10%? We should buy a lottery ticket because it's actually 12%, so pretty close. Um, that's not obviously good news, but it's good to be good guessers. So this is from the Health and Retirement Survey. This is uh, from the University of Michigan's uh, long-lasting study on uh, older Americans, or I'm sorry, yeah, the retired uh, um, Americans uh, from 2004. And what they found is that when you look at all these individual criteria, uh, and mush them all together and demand that everyone meets every single one, only about 12% of people who are older than age, I think, 70 in this sample uh, really qualify, so to speak, as aging successfully. What's kind of interesting is that when you look at the actual individual components, like active engagement or not having disability or not having major diseases, there's a fairly substantial chunk of the population that meets those individual criteria. But when you put them all together, it's a pretty rare phenomenon. So this is kind of a jumping off point to where I think the Stein Institute, Dilip, uh, who's the director, and myself became interested in trying to figure out maybe there are other ways to define successful aging. Uh, and so what we did was we did a, when I say we, uh, I did a literature review on uh, uh, multiple uh, studies that looked at the definition of successful aging in the kind of biomedical context. And so we wanted to find any study that basically separated two groups, people that were s sort of unsuccessful uh, versus successful. Uh, and they had to have from being a sample with, uh, of at least 100 pe people and, and among people over the age of 60 and had to be in, in English in a peer-reviewed journal. And so what we would hope would to find some consensus in this literature to try to figure out what people said was, when I say people, I mean researchers said was successful aging. And what we found was that, by and large, researchers are in complete or near complete disagreement on what successful aging is. And so when you look at the individual criteria, almost all of them had disability or physical functioning as a component. But interestingly, no more than half of the individual study or the, of the studies had any one component in common with each other. <coughs> so there's all kinds of different ways of def defining success. Uh, and actually, I think that's kind of a, a good thing, in a sense, but it's not a good thing from research. If you're going to do research, commit effort to research something, if you can't agree on what that thing is, it becomes very difficult to agree on anything beyond that. So we got interested in, in this a little further and wondered also what older people think about successful aging, and specifically older people in San Diego. And so we we really kind of based it on this idea that around 10 or 12 percent of people uh, felt that uh, that would be kind of characterized as successfully aging. And we, we went ahead and looked at a scale. We basically asked people to rate themselves on a 1 to 10 scale, with 10 being perfect success and 1 being not at all successful. And this is a frequency distribution showing the percentages of the people. And so what we find is that around 90 or so percent of people rate themselves an 8, a 9, or a 10 on this scale. So I would probably go see a movie if it were rated at 8, a 9, or a 10, or go to a restaurant if it were. So I think we can really safely assume that this scale is really getting at something that is showing that people, older people in San Diego feel that they're aging successfully. And we've always been asked, is that because they live in San Diego? It's nice weather <laughs> and so forth. And I don't know if we necessarily know the answer to that question, but it has been replicated in other uh, countries, actually, in other states. And, and this seems to hold true. So. Um, so then we're left with the quandary of w w this discrepancy between what older people think about themselves and what researchers think with regard to success. Um, and so one possibility is that older people are just fooling themselves, right? So maybe they're not successful. Well, what's interesting, and this is, forgive some statistics, but we find that this scale uh, is actually positively associated with age. Uh, so older the older you get, the more successful you feel, uh, at least according to this scale. Uh, it's actually negatively correlated with depression, so the more depression the less successful you feel, the more resilient you feel, the more successful you feel, but also the more physical functional problem or physical functional abilities you have, uh, also the greater success. So this kind of does suggest that it's not completely 
um, uh, based on uh, some judgment that's not related to what people are actually experiencing. There might be some validity to this self-rating. So there is this interesting discrepancy. So then we wanted to know uh, a little, dig a little deeper and find out from older people what they think success means. When they say, what are they saying when they define successful aging? So a, a colleague of, of ours uh, did a number of studies looking at using qualitative interviews, which is different than uh, measures and, and, and uh, biomarkers. This is really just sort of asking people their opinions and having them think out loud about what, in this case, the essential components of aging successfully are. And so putting all that literature and all these transcripts together, I think that a couple of themes really came out. And, and one is, is that older people really emphasize something that's very rarely, if not ever, described in the other studies we just reviewed. They talk about something called adaptability, and being able to maintain a positive attitude despite having problems. And that's very difficult to measure in a study, uh, but it is something that we think is particularly important. We could call it resilience, we could call it lots of things, but it seems particularly relevant to how older people define success. Much more important, indeed, than uh, disability and freedom from chronic disease. So some of the nice quotes we got from this uh, really emphasize adaptation. So this moment right now, because my organisms are working as life, sort of acceptance of the current state, your own image of yourself is still that of somebody in their 20s, 30s, or 40s, you got to realize you're not, and you say, okay, it's all right, and then suit your desires to what's realistic. And then with that, to continue to engage in things. So engagement with respect to, uh, like this quote, we're still growing, we, are in, we still enjoy going to a movie, we still enjoy sleeping with people, we are not sitting in our rooms waiting for something to happen. So I think that really captures kind of this, this alternative view of success. So just in, to summarize this section, uh, I think we can say with respect to successful aging, there are as many definitions as, as, as there are studies and researchers, yet I think we can all agree there's probably more than one thing that defines success, and it's not just longevity. Uh, there's a, there does seem to be this divergence between what researchers and lay people say about success, and particularly what older people say is adaptability is more important than freedom from impairments. So kind of more what Cicero said to be able to adapt. Uh, than kind of what um, Aristotle said. So, actually, we, we also run, uh, in addition to, to, to thinking a lot about successful aging, we also are actively involved in the care of veterans and other populations with mental health problems uh, in San Diego and have been doing that for a long time. And one of the things that we found was particularly interesting is thinking about success and also trying to apply it to populations of people that have problems. And so I think there are some really interesting questions that you can ask. So one being, what are the characteristics who succeed despite mental health problems? So they seem to do well. So there's kind of classic examples like John Nash, Ellen Sachs, who's a, a, a law professor who has schizophrenia. Uh, what, did, what did they do, in a sense? How did they adapt? What did they do on a daily basis to keep them to, uh, well while they experience their mental health problems? And then also the related question is we all uh, have risk factors that we carry around with us, yet how do some people avoid problems? Uh, so people might have risk factors for alcoholism and the like, yet never take a drink or, or don't uh, be so become susceptible. So this is all important in the context of thinking about um, what we can do to promote healthy aging in these populations. And I can assure you there's a dire need to do so. Uh, so, in terms of thinking about the years of your life that are lost as a result of having some of these diagnoses, it's pretty remarkable. So, the average person that has schizophrenia loses around 12 years of life uh, associated with having that illness compared to people that don't have that. And these are other numbers for, for bipolar disorder 10, schizophrenia 14, depression 9. So, there's a, a pretty remarkable uh, impact, I think, of these illnesses on, on the lifespan, and, and that's something that we, this is a population in which healthy aging uh, is, is a, of an up, utmost importance to study. But I think there's also a little bit of a positive story to tell here as well. So these are data from uh, a large sample of patients with schizophrenia that we followed uh, for many years, uh, and this is uh, looking at a, a measure of uh, health-related quality of life. And so we start with the kind of uh, the healthy controls, the people without schizophrenia, 
And we see that there's two aspects to this measure. There's a mental health composite and there's a physical health composite. Mental health remains relatively stable, so here's age on the bottom, higher is better. And then physical health seems to be kind of going down across the lifespan in health, healthy controls. If you look at this same data in patients with schizophrenia, you see a cross. Actually, younger people with schizophrenia feel like their mental health is a lot worse than do older people. Uh, and it's not just because they're uh, way off base, because I think the, the evidence of that is that their physical health composite is also declining at the same rate that uh, is occurring in normal aging. So we got interested in this again and uh, wanted to find out from the perspective of older people with schizophrenia uh, in partnership with NAMI, which is a wonderful organization in town, um, what do people feel like uh, has changed in their lifespan with schizophrenia? So we again turned to some qualitative approaches. We asked people essentially, what is it th th what is the, how has the experience of living with schizophrenia changed for you? Um, and I think this is probably applicable to many chronic mental health problems. What we heard about are really difficult early experiences, or sort of, sort of being alienated from other children and experiencing um, real devastation at younger ages. But in terms of actual people's subjective ex of experience of this illness, they found that it had improved over time. And by and large, they attributed that to their ability to better self-manage the illness. So for example, every time I pass a group of people, I think they are I think that they're talking about me, so I still have the symptom, uh, but I realize I'm able to reason my way through it and say, wait a minute, uh, it doesn't ring true, why would they be talking about me? <coughs> so we're stopping a bit before uh, having something detrimental to my well-being. So that's one positive, I think, element that we have here is that older people with schizophrenia tend to feel that they uh, can manage their illness better. Um, however, when we asked them about what they think about their future moving forward, there was a remarkable set of discrepancies. Uh, one set of patients that we talked to really felt like they had missed out, uh, that they felt like they had really missed out because they were smart enough to do things but um, kind of hadn't had a chance in life and sort of despaired that fact. Uh, another group felt that they were reasonably resigned, so things had really kind of improved relative to their past even though they were sort of w not well off by society standards. Uh, yeah. And another group was actually in later life going back and doing the things that, uh, that they actually would be accomplishing and probably missed out on in their 20s, like getting a car, uh, uh, maybe uh, getting a bank account, sort of life uh, milestones that they'd missed out on and actually fervently going back and, and kind of retracing those steps and we're proud of that fact. So I think that there's a, a lot of knowledge to be garnered from how people manage and cope and adapt to illnesses over time. Another really interesting population, I have a, just a couple more slides on mental health populations, but another really interesting one is people with HIV. So this is a kind of a survivor cohort in a, in a really interesting way. So many of these people had lived through the advent of the new therapies, uh, which really substantially improved the lifespan, changed it from a death sentence into a, a chronic illness within their own lifespans. Um, and at the same time, we know that there's an enormous population and a growing one of people who are older than age 50 that have HIV. And actually what we'll see is actually more than half of the people with uh, HIV will be over age 50 in about three or two years. So this is really an opportunity to understand what successful trajectories might look like. And so we really kind of just started looking at this in the context of HIV. But one way to think about it is looking at the people who have evaded cognitive deficits uh, across their lifespan. So we might expect that people with HIV could experience cognitive deficits. And so we looked at a group that seemed to be successful, at least from the perspective of having no objective cognitive impairment and no subjective cognitive impairment, so that if they didn't feel like they had cognitive problems. Uh, so these are people who were at mean age of 50 and that had an infection for around 17 years. We found about a third of people kind of met this criteria of not showing any evident cognitive impairment. And what we found is that really in terms of thinking about uh, the, the predictors of who, who belongs in these groups, it's actually interesting to look at what was s significantly associated and what was n not significantly associated. So the things that were associated were things like lower rates of lifetime depression, uh, better skills and medication adherence of being better at taking a medication, and then having a better relationship with your healthcare provider. The things actually that weren't associated with 
uh, successful cognitive aging were uh, uh, the actual severity of the illness as measured by uh, CD4 count, the duration of the illness, how long it lasted, or the number of other medical problems. So really kind of the things that you would expect that would be associated at a population level with cognitive health in the sample were not related, but some of these other factors, these more psychological and kind of behavioral factors seem to be more related. So this is, I think, a, an interesting group to think about. Well, what about this other idea of looking at people with risk factors for illnesses, uh, but yet no declines? Um, uh, so this is actually a very difficult study to do, and not one I was involved with, but this is a group that looked at the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, which is a long-lasting, uh, age-related study that's followed people for many years, and this is a post-mortem study, so they looked at people's brains after death, and what they did was they looked at the people who, before, they were able to look back and see the people who had cognitive impairment before they died, and people who didn't have cognitive impairment. Both groups had the same amount of Alzheimer's pathology, so plaques and tangles in their brains uh, once they had passed away, but some of them actually didn't show cognitive impairment. Uh, and some of them did. And so that's kind of interesting. And so what they wanted to find out is whether this was related to change in cerebral blood flow prior to that. And what they found is that the patients that seem to have the same pathology seem to have greater increases in regional cerebral blood flow in the years pre uh, preceding death than their comparators. And what this means is that it seems to suggest that those people with Alzheimer's uh, that, that had the pathology seemed to actually adapt, in a sense, to the illness over time, whereas those that showed cognitive impairment didn't adapt. Um, and there's a n this, so this is kind of really suggests that even in people with Alzheimer's, the brain uh, in some people can still adapt, and that's actually a pretty remarkable story. And so uh, I think, again, comes back to Cicero. So. I think the idea of applying these to specific mental health conditions is actually kind of interesting one because what we can look at is people who survive and how they did it. Uh, we actually have a, a kind of a, a statistician who, who works with us who's developed a way to study these kinds of changes over the lifespan in, in an accelerated way. Uh, and I think a key element here is, is particularly in marginalized groups like people with HIV or maybe older people with schizophrenia, asking people about success and how they do things well uh, actually seems to generate a lot of information and also really increases buy-in from groups that are often not included in research studies. So I'm going to shift gears and talk about why we age and try to circle back to how that relates to, to the topic at hand. So believe it or not, we still uh, don't know why we age. And so um, these are, are different animals, obviously. And, 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 and the amazing thing in the, in the kind of literature uh, or in the outside in the natural environment is that there are some enormous differences between animals that seem pretty phenotypically similar. So a turtle is kind of like a lizard without a shell and a mouse is kind of like a bat without wings, so they're not that different, and yet their lifespans, maximum lifespans, in the absence of predators are amazingly different. So we're looking at around 50 time, 50 fold for the lizard and 10 year, or 10 times for the mouse. And so well, why is that? Maybe there's something fundamentally changing the rate of aging uh, by the purpose of growing a shell or wings. So that's one option in terms of living longer. You can grow a shell or wings. Um, <laughs> or you can choose the right parents, right? So you can uh, be born with good genes. So um, we, we understand longevity through uh, at least the heritability of it, so the contributions of genes to longevity through twin studies. And so these are data from a twin study. So we have identical twins here and dizygotic ones here, ones that are uh, fraternal. And so we have the age, the lifespan of twin one on the, right, on the y axis and then the, uh, of twin two on the x axis. And so we do some fancy calculations and try to figure out what the contribution from that of people that have completely the shared genes versus 50% shared, uh, what, the, what the, essentially the contribution of, of heritability is. Uh, to longevity. So if you think about that in terms of a percent, your height is around 90% uh, determined by your genes, what you're born with. So your kind of height is pretty much spoken for by the time 
you were born. Where would you put your lifespan? What would you guess in terms of a percent? Thinking about your height is around 90% heritable. What percent would you imagine? I thought I heard 50, 70? 40. 40. Just a good guess, it's between 20 and 30. Uh, 20, 30 percent. Um, and so that's, so I mean, you can basically see that from seeing that these are the monozygotic twins. The actual uh, dots seem a little closer together, but there's still a lot of variability there. And there's a little bit more fanning out here. So about 20 to 30 percent, which does imply that the flip side of that is that there's a significant amount of variation in longevity that uh, kind of happens after you're born, right? So things that happen after you're born matter. Um, another interesting fact, I think, when you think about aging and genes, what their influence really would be on you is that um, most of our aging occurs after, uh, at least in women, after the age of maximum reproduction. So, uh, so what that basically means is that things that would be selected out of the population uh, that by virtue of uh, the phenotype before uh, maximum age of reproductive age are not sort of subject to that sort of selection anymore. Um, so in essence, we're kind of living beyond our warranty period. You can kind of think of it that way. Uh, and so our genes aren't protecting us in a sense from a lot of things that happen in late life. So it's really kind of difficult to estimate what happens with age and genes. And I think so even beyond that, there's even more mystery, I think, when you think about uh, genes and in, in aging, in that this is a, an experiment where they took uh, worms, and they, uh, which are often studied in aging research, that had, uh, they were genetically identical, they were manu engineered to be gen genetically identical, uh, and they were raised in constant environment. So they got rid of the environmental variability and the genetic variability, and so you'd think they'd all kind of kick the bucket at the same, on the same day, and when, in fact, there's a huge amount of variability in longevity, even in that same jar. So this suggests that some variation in the lifespan at this point, anyway, seems to be beyond our understanding. And that's, again, why this is such a mysterious uh, condition, so-called aging. The other amazing thing uh, I think that, that it's important to point out, I think, is that this is probably the best time to age that's ever been. Um, and so, uh, when you think about uh, the kind of distribution of the population in 1900 versus to where it is now, it's a pretty remarkable change. And this really suggests that the environment has become much more pro, uh, beneficial for aging than it's ever been. So in 1900, uh, the proportion of the population, each bar here represents a chunk of the population. And so in 1900, the majority of people who were uh, walking on the earth or, or crawling were between zero and four. And then uh, really of only a small chunk of the population was uh, between 75 and 85. Even two generations later, that's not that much, uh, there becomes a rectangle. And so you see the shift over here. The actual bar is, this is uh, towards women. So there's more women than men who are in, in their 80s. So that's a pretty remarkable shift in a, in a short amount of time. Here's the situation in, in Japan. Uh, it starts off in 1950 as a pyramid. And then in 2009, it's uh, more like a triangle, um, a rectangle. And then in 2050, it's an upside down triangle. So that's a pretty rapid shift to an aging population. And so there are a couple interesting ways to think about this. If you look at this, and at least in the United States, there are more people over the age of 65 than, there have, uh, than children for the first time ever. And another way to think about it that I've heard is that there are more people older than age 60, or two-thirds of the people who have ever lived to age 65 are actually alive right now. Um, so this is a, a really a, amazing time, I think, to be, to be older. Maybe the first time that we've had this cadre of older people. So that's just a longevity we've covered so far. Um, what about the health span? And so, um, Robert Fogel is a you know, famous uh, uh, economist in Chicago, and he's done a number of studies uh, looking at the aging process. Uh, but actually, by using a fairly creative method, he's gone back and looked at the Civil War medical records of Union Army soldiers and compared them to their descendants. And so you can get things. Obviously, these are not uh, electronic medical records like we have today, but they did have height, weight, and other kinds of characteristics, age of onset of illnesses. And what he's found is that the average man in 1850 uh, uh, was about five foot seven and uh, weighed about 145 pounds. Uh, 
And then just two generations later, he's now five foot nine and two inches taller and about 50 pounds heavier. Now, normally you think about gaining 50 pounds as being a bad thing, and usually it, it is, but the, the difference here is really that this gentleman in 1850 was largely fairly malnourished uh, and probably underweight. And when you look at the actual age of onset of, of the illnesses we usually think about with aging, so that would include things like heart disease, arthritis, cancer, which is here, respiratory problems that occur in later life, uh, that generation of people uh, got those illnesses about 10 years earlier in their lives. So they had kind of a shorter time to which they actually got those age-associated illnesses. Um, so we're, we're, our health span is about maybe 10 years longer, at least with respect to these chronic illnesses. Just a more, couple more things to think about when being thankful for the kind of current state of, of aging. You had about a 75% or 25% chance of, of dying in infancy and then only a, about a 40% chance that you might die before you reach the age of 15 in, during the Civil War. Uh, the leading causes, the reason why people died was typically infectious diseases due to problems in the water supply uh, and the lack of antibiotics. Uh, we've essentially solved that problem in a lot of respects in the United States. Um, and actually life was not necessarily that great even if you were able to make it out past age 15. So you spend about 75% of your money on food, clothing, and shelter, and now it's only about 13% on average. Obviously, this is different. And then when you think about the work day, we have to think about we work hard these days. Th this is actually the actual Civil War era person worked very long hours and only only two hours a day per leisure, with an estimation of around 50% of our time spent in leisure activities. So life was tough back then, and and I think took its toll on people and gave them those illnesses. So. Um, so this is, I think, indication that aging is a really evolving process. And one of the things that we'd really love to have uh, would be a biomarker or some sort of marker of aging, the aging process, so we could then figure out um, what, what, whether any intervention we were doing was working or not and maybe extending the health span. There is no such single biomarker of age, uh, but there is a lot of excitement about something called the telomere. And this is uh, part of the chromosome. The, these are all chromosomes. And the, at the ends of the chromosome is the telomere. And each time the cell replicates, part of it gets cleaved off. And the uh, thought is, is that uh, the more cleaving, the more replication is an indication of cellular aging, which has been taken as an indication of accelerated aging. So this is somewhat a biomarker for aging, or at least accelerated aging. Um, and so what's interesting in a sample of people who are already doing well, these are people who are uh, in their years 100, centenarians, uh, they looked at the length of the telomere. So in this case, longer, better. Uh, so compared to shorter, having a shorter telomere, there's actually fairly distributed or broad uh, effects associated with this. So people with a longer telomere had lower rates of hypertension, uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, better cognitive function. And so this is kind of fitting under the idea that there are some fundamental aspects of aging that kind of undergird or are fundamental to all the illnesses we treat. We focus a lot on diabetes, cancer, and so forth. But there are some things that are potentially biologically important that are related to those and, and maybe at a deeper level than, than illnesses themselves. Circling back to mental health, um, it's actually, there's a recent study, which I have not included in this slide, and should, it was actually last week, that found in a large sample that people with depression, uh, and particularly people with chronic uh, depression, seem to have shorter telomeres, uh, and also greater evidence of oxidative stress. Um, there does seem to be uh, some evidence that changing telomerase might improve treatment response, at least from some of these studies. Uh, telomerase is actually the, the, uh, one of the, the helpers for telomeres. Schizophrenia, there's actually some evidence that telomeres are shorter on average, as, as well as in caregivers of developmentally disabled children, and then also in people with HIV. So there's some fundamental overlap here, I think, with aging and accelerated aging and some of these illnesses. Okay, so then I think this really kind of brings us to what can you do, and I have some slides about this. So I have a first, just two, I promise, uh, pessimistic or sort of uh, maybe three uh, pessimistic slides um, about what we can do about the behaviors that we can do uh, with regard to successful aging. The first one is that in the context of thinking about mental health, um, depression 
really, when you think about it, interferes with just about all of the things that we know are associated with living longer and healthier lives. So it, older people who are depressed tend to get less exercise, they uh, tend to have worse diets, they're certainly less likely to be engaging in cognitively stimulating activities and definitely less likely to be optimistic than their non-depressed counterparts. Uh, they tend to be more uh, withdrawn from social interactions, and they also tend to have negative attitudes towards aging in the future, and they're often undergoing a lot of stress. And so together, basically, you can think about depression as essentially reducing one's access to successful aging, and so it really highlights the need to treat it aggressively and treat it quickly and in, in older people. Um, so that's a, a sort of a sobering way to think about it. Another way to think about it, you often hear about when you should start uh, worrying about aging, and usually the answer is many, many years ago. <laughs> so your peak, peak ages of physical performance are somewhere uh, for your hearing peaked at age five, your smell at age 10, your taste at age 10, uh, your short-term memory at 20, if you can remember that long, immune response at age 13. Um, so we've been all aging for a while now, and so um, uh, the, the ability to, to sort of go back and change that trajectory at its beginning is difficult. The other kind of, I think, depressing news around dinner time is to think about that the most kind of effective way to live longer in animals is through caloric restriction. And so this is uh, actually uh, in mice uh, who are eating in about uh, two-thirds of what they would normally eat, they tend to live about 40% uh, uh, longer. Um, there's some evidence of the same effect in primates, and there are actually human trials uh, that are going on, so eating around two-thirds two of the normal dietary diet. So this is, uh, um, you know, the guy on the left here, the monkey on the left here, has been subjected to a calorically restricted diet, and his cellmate on the right not so much, and so you can see some of the phenotypes of aging more evident in this guy, but my point is, is that both of them look pretty depressed to me, <laughs> and neither seem particularly delighted. So maybe caloric restriction may not be a, a, a route to mental health. But I think there's a lot to be optimistic about uh, in thinking about this kind of stuff. And the first one, I think, for those of you uh, who are older, is that just by growing older, the data does seem to suggest that you're going to be more life satisfied with your life. Um, and so this is kind of the prototypical U-shaped curve, which has been seen in well-being literature for many years, which is that basically you're happiest or most satisfied with your life when you're younger, and then right around 40 is kind of the bottom, and then this is across countries, uh, that actually starts to go back up and actually peaks up again around 60 or 70. So actually the peak ages for um, well-being are, are actually there's two, uh, youth and later life. Australians, if anyone's Australian, for some reason there's no effect there. <laughs> it's just kind of flat. And then I think the more optimistic view with respect to mental health is that um, in addition to the idea that we can treat depression, it's a treatable illness uh, in, in a lot of respects, um, a lot of ways of actually thinking about successful aging behaviors or interventions such as exercise, diet, cognitive stimulation, becoming more optimistic, becoming more socially integrated, having a better op attitude towards aging, are actually potential treatment targets for depression that might be kind of out of the box or uh, atypical. And that's not that far-fetched an idea. So there's been a number of studies looking at exercise as an antidepressant physical activity. So this is comparing uh, the effects of giving older adults who are depressed significantly uh, either physical activity intervention or an antidepressant or both. And what they found was that each of these interventions worked for preventing I'm sorry, reducing major depression to a, a quite a low level. And what they also found is that, uh, that the exercise group, who, the people who continued to exercise after the study seemed to have better durability of those antidepressant effects. So exercise working about as well as an antidepressant in older adults. Um, this is actually a, from a study that was a very large one that looked at the benefits of cognitive training uh, in essentially healthy older adults. 
And wh what they found was that essentially you can get better at uh, performance on tests, uh, and there is some benefit to functioning as well of engaging in cognitive training. But one of the lesser known papers, what one I thought was particularly interesting, was that one of their uh, cognitive training interventions, speed of processing uh, training, uh, actually reduce depressive symptoms to a significant extent. So actually training the brain might actually reduce depression as well. And then yet another um, way might be with uh, diet. And dietary studies are particularly difficult to do, but this is one that looked at the incidence of depression uh, as it is associated with the population distribution of the Mediterranean diet pattern. So this is basically eating a low uh, level of uh, saturated fats, drinking a little bit of wine and uh, fruits, nuts, and vegetables, and low amounts of red meat. And what they found is that the people who engaged in this were, uh, at least nationally, were less likely to be depressed. Um, we actually just completed a study looking at uh, body mass index as it would pertain to cognitive ability and serious mental health problems, and we found that patients with bipolar disorder <coughs> With, uh, who are obese or overweight had worse cognitive functioning. And so there is a, potentially, in the amount of that effect was about the same as actually having bipolar disorder compared to normal controls, so healthy controls. So uh, these, these kind of behaviors are really things to be taken seriously <laughs> with respect to healthy aging and potentially dysfunctional abilities in people with mental health problems. So what if you combined all of these things together? So this is the nurses' health study data. This is a long-lasting study that's looked at around 85,000 nurses and, uh, and followed them over time. And what they were interested in finding out was what are the, what's it like in terms of the cardiovascular risk of people who are not currently smoking, that were drinking a low or moderate amount of alcohol uh, versus a lot of alcohol or none, a half an hour, did a half an hour of physical activity each day and had this kind of Mediterranean diet, a diet with a lot of fiber, fish oil, uh, low polysaturated to saturated fat, uh, uh, I'm sorry, high uh, unsaturated to saturated fats, uh, and low in sugar. And what they found is that the effect of doing that relative to the people, if you did all those things, relative to doing none of them, you actually reduced your risk of cardiovascular disease by about 80%, which is greater than any medication, I think, that you could probably acquire. So this is a pretty low-risk lifestyle in terms of cardiovascular and other types of health that can be attained. And I think even more interesting from a neuroscience perspective is that each of these in terms of being good for the brain, each of these types of interventions, doing crossword puzzles or intellectual activities or um, calorically restricting yourself or exercising, um, they're all very different behaviors, but they actually might share a common pathway. They are all, all kind of like mild stressors. Um, and so sort of like the vaccine, uh, they actually might produce uh, antibodies in a sense. They uh, produce uh, neurotrophic factors to kind of basically improve the health of the brain. There's a pathway that's been described for this in, in uh, mouse models. And there's, so, so basically, by engaging in any of these activities, there are multiple ways to improve brain health. So a couple more thoughts of, about um, what you can do to age well, and particularly relevant for, for the idea of mental health, is optimism. Um, this is a study, a study of Dutch men between the ages of 64 and 84, and what they found is that the men who had low optimism tended to not survive as long uh, as did uh, people who were optimistic. And this was controlling and adjusting for lots of other variables at baseline. Um, and so uh, th there really is some, I think, evidence, and this is obviously something that's not included often in successful aging models. At our center, we studied a good deal, something called resilience, which is kind of a related concept. Um, and we've used a scale called the Connor Davidson Resilience Scale. There are other ways that we're thinking about this, and I think a future talk will be on resilience. But this idea that resilience involves several things. It, it involves feeling like you have control over your circumstances and kind of an orientation towards future goals, and also to be able to tolerate and adapt to bad things happening to you, to deal with negative emotions. Interesting. Older adults seem to, the, the, among older adults in our sample, uh, being able to tolerate negative emotions was actually something that was most associated with positive outcomes. But a rather busy slide uh, that we have, but one that 
basically suggests, and I'll give you the, the punchline to this one, is that for older people who seem to be depressed or were more depressed, if you were resilient or rated yourself high and resilient, you still felt you were aging well. Um, so even older people that were depressed, even if they have some of these kinds of uh, characteristics like resilience or optimism, it may protect, protect them from the functional impact of having um, depression, for example. And I think that it's possible, and there are models for it, that you can teach optimism and resilience. And so uh, I think that there's potentially some real avenues there to treating depression and aging. A couple more um, slides on an area that I'm particularly interested in. So that, that covers uh, lifestyle behaviors. It covers kind of psychological characteristics. Um, but then the question is kind of what do you do with your day, right? What do, you, what do you choose to do? How can you spend your time? And so I've been really interested in looking at data from something called the day reconstruction method, which is kind of a different way of asking people about their time. And so it's a time diary mixed with their, um, uh, uh, an affect or emotion diary. So in a sense, you're asking people to rate what they're doing and then how they feel at that moment, which gives you a very different answer to what when you ask people when they're happiest. So for example, uh, when you ask people when they're happiest, they usually say it's when they're with their kids. But then when you actually look at data like this, in terms of what are people doing when they're least and most happy, it's usually when they're around their kids that are the most stressed and the most kind of <laughs> irritated. And I can tell you from personal experience that that's uh, potentially relevant. So we were interested in looking at some data that from uh, around 4,000 uh, people uh, and are hopefully looking at more data in the near future, but looking at what are people doing when they're feeling the best across age? Are there age differences in, in, in that? And what we found is that actually the answer is it's pretty consistent uh, when you look at the happiest times in which people are engaging. So for the most part, exercising, believe it or not, is what people say or what, uh, what seem to be doing when they're the, the feeling the best in terms of happiness. Really the only age effect that we saw, uh, uh, socializing being another, eating and drinking, um, working actually emerged in older age as something that so the subset of people that were engaged in work seemed to be particularly, uh, to, to rate that experience particularly highly. What about not happy, sort of the bottom, so feeling not unhappy, um, sort of a lack of happiness? Well, interestingly, younger people, as opposed to older ones, work is at the bottom. So people who are younger, up to age around 45, really rate work as a pretty, pretty not, not a happy activity. But across the board, we see TV as something that's a really kind of neutral and perhaps even low activity in terms of enjoyment. People don't seem to enjoy themselves when they're watching TV. And so then we looked at the amount of time that people spend watching TV. And, and actually, as opposed to what we thought we would see, which would be that the people who were younger were watching the most TV, we found that around fairly linearly across the lifespan, the proportion of one's time during the day spent watching TV with age increases to the extent it gets to be about 25 to 35 percent of the time is spent engaging primarily in TV. And uh, right around retirement, that, you know, other types of leisure, so uh, reading, uh, 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 knitting, and so forth, also increase, but they don't really outstrip the, the sort of steady increase in TV watching. So I think from, if you cross this slide with that slide, what you see is really there's potentially a reservoir of happiness that people can attain by trying to do something else besides TV. One more side from these studies. Uh, one, one thing that we do know is that, um, that there is a fairly large difference between the amount of time people spend with other people versus uh, without, uh, so being alone. So the proportion of time that people in their 20s and 30s spend alone is around 40%, whereas in the sample of people in their 60s and 70s, it's around 60%. So that's a, a fairly significant difference. And we know that, at least from these data, that you're happiest when you're around other people. So the blue line is being alone, and then the other lines are being with someone else. There is a kind of a twist to that, in that you're happiest when you're around, when you're younger, you're happiest when you're around uh, your spouse, and when you're older, you're happiest when you're around anyone else. Um, but you're still happier when you're with your spouse than being by yourself, which I think is a good, uh, good message for the, for the couples.
So really there are a lot of modifiable factors that can change the trajectories of successful aging and what we're trying to argue uh, in, in new research is that these kinds of things can actually alter the trajectories uh, and are particularly important for people with mental health problems and maybe also inter alter the trajectories of the problems themselves. But things like exercise, diet, mental activities, optimism, social integration, positive attitudes towards aging and stress reduction are all kinds of things that really carry a significant amount of weight in terms of enhancing the lifespan and health span. So I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap up and, and really with sort of four points or three points really. And th there are many choices in defining successful aging. Uh, older adults, I s happen to like the, the definition that they provide, but it's a really challenging field to study, but I think a potentially important one as well. Uh, but adaptability seems to be a key theme in what older people say. And I think there's really a, a research role for understanding success uh, with regard to trajectories and adaptations, what people do, and then protective factors in thinking about chronic mental health problems or also other illnesses like cancer and other chronic illnesses like HIV. Um, and I think it's really important to think about how the biobehavioral determinants of successful aging are both negatively impacted by mental health problems, but also potentially treatment targets for mental health problems. And I think that's kind of a launching off point from, for future work, like we hope. So with that, I want to say thank you and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, so the, the interesting, th this is a... Uh, um, there's actually a fairly serious literature on happiness now that, and a lot of monitoring of it. And, and I think this really comes from this, uh, especially when thinking about economy, that people have, have really begun to think about. Um, the average uh, life satisfaction for Americans uh, since 1950 has, has reasonably stable, actually has declined a little bit. Uh, but the average gross domestic product has kind of tripled or quadrupled even in that span. Um, and so sort of short-term changes in, um, so, so basically that seems to suggest there's a decoupling of income uh, and, and money potentially and uh, happiness. And, and that's n kind of true. But um, what they've done really is, is, is in this realm of research is to find that around sort of where you're fed, clothed, and sheltered, uh, around so $45,000, $50,000 a year, looking at cross countries, um, you're, the, anything, any money below that actually makes a big difference in terms of your happiness. Um, but after that, it really levels off and still, can, I mean, obviously, you're still um, having a little bit more money is not a bad thing, but it really levels off to where uh, each incremental uh, dollar makes less and less of a difference in terms of just sort of gross happiness. Um, so uh, I think w the key thing to think about with regard to economic downturns and those things, does it kind of force people to go beyond the kind of level at which they're, you know, sort of at the kind of don't have the basic necessities uh, in life? And I think once you get beyond that, it certainly does make a difference. Oh, yeah. Well, this is actually, and this is, a, I think, a problem with this literature. I'll go back to that slide. So this is about resilience and going over these factors. I don't necessarily, um, um, this is actually from a, a scale that measures resilience. I don't think this is the, the be-all, end-all answer to resilience. This is actually conceptualizing as resilience as a kind of personality trait, so that there would be resilient people and not people. There you can also think about resilience after a specific event or a trauma. So there's mm -hmm. people who are uh, interested in post-traumatic growth, so people who've gone through traumatic experiences and sort of um, be felt that they've become better people as a result. Um, so there's a lot of ways to look at resilience, um, and so this is kind of one way, but at least within this one scale, I think the key distinctions were really this difference between an active uh, orientation, sort of personal control goal orientation, and then one where it's sort of being able to tolerate changes uh, without necessarily making changes. Mm -hmm. So um, I wouldn't necessarily say this is the be-all, end-all of what those things are. But yeah.